So we talked about weathering, we talked about that breakdown of material, and so now we're going to continue on and, and more specifically focus on that erosion part, or actually moving this material, and specifically focus on some different types of mass movements, or, or move a lot of material at one time. And so we see, that in, because we're going to come back, one of the last things we'll talk about is this example in the background of the Oso landslide that occurred up in Washington State in 2014, and, and one of the most deadly uh, landslides in the United States has occurred um, in any historical record. And so kind of talk about the processes tied to that, why that occurred, and more generally um, some issues around, again, these mass movements and their hazards. So, you know, correspondingly, our video for this uh, is Landslide by Fleetwood Mac. So, as we've talked about in the last video, that weathering is that breakdown of rock in place. Now we're going to focus on that movement of material, that you know, move, transport, depositing of it, usually downslope because of gravity. Um, and so again, uh, this is all tied to that geomorphology aspect. How does our landscape change? Um, you know, and particularly one of the main ways it changes is through these mass movements or downslope movement of lots of material, earth materials uh, under the force of gravity, often at, at uh, rap di varying different types of speeds, as we'll come to see, uh, looking at different types of these mass movements. So um, we'll conclude as well, looking a little bit at some other types of erosion um, in a future, some future videos, particularly fluvial erosion and glacial erosion. So fluvial meaning running waters, things like rivers, and glacial erosion, well, glaciers. Um, there's also wind erosion and coastal erosion. We won't really talk about those actually to any uh, extent within the course. Those are also important in certain environments, wind especially in arid environments and uh, coastal environments, uh, uh, of course, uh, are really impacted by the waves um, beating on the shores, for example. But we'll be talking a little bit more specifically also about fluvial and glacial erosion in the coming lectures. So there's very there's many different ways we can come to try and also understand rates of erosion or how much material is moving or how fast it's moving, you know, over time, uh, you know, how much of it per amount of time. Um, is moving. Um, so just I'll give you a few quick examples here. Again, this is just tying to how do we know the things that we, we think we know um, in terms of measuring and doing the science of, the, of this measuring of erosion. So things like erosion pins, so you can just put, you know, certain metal rods or things in the landscape that you know where you put them, and you can come back later, you know, oftentimes years or months to years later and see, you know, has material actually buried it? So as material been deposited there or has it been eroded away you know there's that material then some that indicating it's moved um, there's also more chemical and uh, isotopic methods so kind of going down to the molecular scale um, we can kind of look at concentration of different isotopes or different elements um, within ma materials and that can help us actually relate uh, to erosion rates and there's also things like just going out and you know, measuring the topography you know actually seeing physically how the landscape has changed over time through various survey methods um, and kind of one upcoming really exciting uh, thing of, you know, that a lot of geographers uh, and kind of more physical geographers are interested in are this is structure from motion uh, that's what we see on the bottom right here so actually making these physical landscape models from a series of lots of photographs um, and you can you make these three-dimensional models and using those to start understand uh, you actually observing landscape change over time it's kind of one of the most exciting and new avenues in the past recent years um, that a lot of geographers and many earth scientists and more generally are really getting excited about and using a lot of. But to get back to the topic at hand here um, and talk about these mass movements or downslope movements of earth materials, um, you know, to note that really it's all tied to the slope and uh, kind of the angle of that slope. And so particularly what we want to focus on is what is known as the angle of repose. So that is the steepest angle at which a given material will remain stable. So for example, I've, on the bottom right here, I have this example of sand. Sand has an angle of repose about 33 to 35 degrees from, again, if we were talking horizontal up to vertical, kind of this angle here is that angle of repose. Rocks kind of more cohesive together than sand um, in one big boulder um, can have a steeper uh, angle of repose, possibly up to usually about 45 degrees or in some cases, even more vertical uh, walls, if you look at you know, very steep, uh, angular you know, rock surfaces. So um, 
But again, this is all, once again, as we talked about in the previous video, it depends on gravity, that driving force versus the frictional strength uh, or resisting force. So this is basically, it just comes down to a couple of basic physical forces here. Essentially, it's, you know, that those, those two forces resisting each other. As we can look at that here, essentially it's, we have this shear stress versus the norm, this normal stress. And the, really, I don't want to focus too much on the physics of it, get too deep. But it's basically here we have, the, you know, I'm showing these different types of um, arrows to direct you. Um, essentially, we have the resisting force is shown by the black arrow. The driving force is shown by the blue arrow. That's our gravity. And those green arrows are just showing the kind of make up components of the, the vector components of our gravitational force. And essentially, our block here that we see on our slope on the left hand side is going to remain stable because that resisting force of the friction is greater than our gravitational force. On the right, now we've got a very steep slope. That gravity force is going to exceed and be greater than that resisting force, and so that block would start moving down that slope. So, uh, you know, uh, there's also other parts that do come into play here. Um, so there's things uh, resisting the force of cohesion. We talk about a more cohesive rock sand doesn't really have any cohesion to it. Um, other types, as we know here, clay, for example, actually does have very is very sticky has a very high cohesion. Um, but really, um, we're not going to worry too much about the materials aspect of these, but rather we want to know, uh, on terms of different mass movements, what are the what are the different processes or what are the actual things that can trigger our mass movements to occur? That's what I'm much more interested in you knowing about um, and kind of geographically where those might occur. So, for example, adding you know, water, we've talked about where is the distribution of water across the Earth, right? Adding water to soil or rock uh, on slopes, especially steeper slopes, usually decreases that slope stability. It's much more likely to trigger something like a landslide or a big mass movement. Um, other things like adding just weight to that slope, um, particularly in, in removing cohesive elements or removing tree roots, which actually really help um, kind of oftentimes stabilize slopes. If you have a fire, if you log a slope, that slope all of a sudden becomes much more likely to have a big mass failure um, or have that material move down slope um, much more quickly. And even things like, well, we've talked about earthquakes here in the Pacific Northwest. Earthquakes are another thing that can help. Um, we have some indicators that you know, a lot of our landslides that we see in this region of the world uh, are likely due in part due to earthquakes um, activating them. So I'm going to talk briefly through some different main types of mass movements here. See that all these different types on the right. Um, we're just going to go into the, the, some brief examples and you know, talk a little bit through many of these. But I want you to take away that the main characteristics or kind of what defines uh, the classes that we see here are moisture content and the speed of movement. Those are two main types of things uh, that are really defining out all these different classes. So is it is it dry or is it more wet and does it move slowly or does it move really fast? Those you know, kind of are the two axes that we operate on in determining all these different classes. And so when we think of, you know, we actually look at this at a global scale, we could kind of fairly easily you know, intuitively predict that where we generally see higher um, slopes is where we also see greater landslide risk. So for example, the Himalayan mountains, other uh, very high slope, you know, the Rocky Mountains, the Andes Mountains, and where we have these very high gradient places, those also generally are where we see some of the greatest areas of risk for things like landslides that we'll talk about. But first, we're going to start uh, a lot slower than landslides. We're going to actually talk about creep. <laughs> As its name implies, hopefully, uh, it is, you can probably figure out, it's quite slow. Um, and so it is, you know, this almost imperceptible uh, mass movement occurring over a very long time scale. So years, tens of years, hundreds of years at the minimum, um, and, and again, moving material ever so slowly and not very much. Um, so we usually actually can go out and if you're very perceptive on the landscape and see this and kind of reveal to you on things like tilted trees, tilted fence posts, a lot of human-made things, kind of cracked roads, leaning poles. Um, these are things that we can actually you know, help observe. So on this left-hand side, actually have this creep of this material down here just off of the slope, kind of creeping very slowly over many years onto the sidewalk, and very imperceptible if you're not looking for it. 
um, oftentimes, but you can go out and observe it if you have a very keen eye. So, but it's something that you, know, you should you can at least go and look out for uh, and train your eye as a geomorphologist. Another uh, very slow um, process that occurs here is known as soliflexion. And so this is occurring in very cold and or high latitude. Um, so high, excuse me, cold, high latitude or uh, and or high elevation areas. And so as the name implies, sola, um, you know, soil and flexion to flow. Uh, this is basically flowing soil. It's soil that basically ends up flowing in these lobes as we see here. Um, on the left-hand side, this is an example from Alaska, um, when essentially you know, the soil, most of the year gets frozen in place because it's cold, but when it thaws out in some summer months, it kind of becomes almost gelatinous-like and kind of slowly oozes down uh, these slopes over time. So another example here uh, from Niwot Ridge, you know, we're looking at some of this, and also we have a lab tied to this module. Um, you know, there's an, an example from the Front Range in Colorado, um, we're looking at you can see these lobes. Uh, they're kind of hard to see, but you can these little white areas here. Um, you can imagine these um, are these same exposed areas out here. You can see the little um, front lobes of them here as well. So you're looking at that in Google Earth. Now, but now to start speeding things up a little bit more. Um, in general, uh, we're going to have we look at some different examples here in slumps versus slides. So essentially, the idea here is a slump is something that is a movement that occurs on a curved plane where a slide is something well like generally you can think of a slide that you might go down at a park uh, it generally has is on a straight plane um, and so that is our difference between slumps and slides um, and so we'll look at these different types um, whether it's rock slides or landslides or what have you but so for example rock slides again we have that kind of along a singular plane a large block essentially breaking loose and moving down so that's an example on the left hand side at this kind of straight line, a collapse of this rock face here, break down. We can think of rock fall being slightly different, and that's just kind of singular kind of chunks of rock breaking free, um, oftentimes from steep slopes. And these are very, this is, you know, a very common hazard that we have here in our own state. So um, real commonly, you know, this example on the left-hand side is a picture from ODOT, you know, Department of Transportation, and you know, commonly roads are closed because of these various rock slides and falls that are occurring along these roads and, and you know having roads having to be rebuilt in these areas but you know, we also have this commonly occurring in many less populated or more mountainous areas where people aren't really living so this example on the right hand side from Sawtooth Mountain um, but there's many you know there's many cases of this is very prevalent of course and common in our own state uh, and but you know again so those were some of those we had talked about slides, but now we're going to move to slumps. Again, this is where we have that movement on a curved plane. So we can see that on the bottom right here. So kind of think of it as a scoop, kind of having this kind of rotational element to it. Um, and so really these slumps are oftentimes, as we noted prior, one of the main ways they're caused is they're more a wet uh, type of movement. And that usually where you get an addition of water, um, this material um, kind of becomes looser and moves down can run out but also then in some element maybe turn into a flow as well so when we move more to fluid uh, elements here especially where the, as the name would imply it's a flow it has lots of fluid in it it's a much more wet uh, type of mass movement than those say a rock fall which is relatively dry just the rock collapsing off um, but here we have in you know, this fluid movement so earth flows and debris flows for example um, and most of what we've been kind of generally been moving in the speed up direction. Earth flows are the one um, kind of contradiction to that. This is actually, this is actually a very slow moving flow, um, of mostly kind of fine grained material. And so what we're seeing here as an example, this picture here is the Slum Gullion uh, Earth Flow, which is in Colorado. Um, essentially, we have this material that's up here kind of flowing off the mountain, and it's all right here in front of us. You're kind of coming down in this valley here. We know that's very slow moving because there's vegetation going on. We, there's actually material that you know is, is, is a it's very it moves maybe a few centimeters down per year, but relatively you know for the vegetation that's slow enough where vegetation can essentially be rooted in place. Um, where in contrast, a debris flow is very fast moving. It's, it's something that oftentimes you can't even outrun or outdrive. It's, it moves extremely fast across the landscape. Um, 
and has a huge mixture kind of boiling uh, or at least you know this kind of roiling mixture of water and, and, and sediment and various whatever it can pick up oftentimes in its way um, and we know that because it leaves then these unvegetated scars on the landscape essentially we're you know if we want to think of it that way where this vegetation that was engulfed in the flows we can see this example here where we have this lands kind of landslide debris fall off this mountain we can see exactly where it occurred because it really sc scooped out everything there um, there's other examples mount hood is a good example as um, we talked about lahars earlier with, with volcanoes um, we, we kind of have these big channels that are essentially big debris flows um, and you can check out a video here tied to that as well um, but to come back to the oso landslide then because of debris flow a very quick moving collapse this huge area um, ended up in a dead, one of the deadliest landslide events um, we're going to bury this whole community that had been built there only a few years prior um, and again this is uh, this great quick moving slump around it was really debris flow material that kind of came across uh, this valley and so you can we tie to this you know, reading um, a little bit more about this as well for this week's module uh, for the lab specifically um, but you know, some of the reasons why this happened again there's a variety of factors and that are all kind of actually geographic right we, we have geology or kind of specific makeup of material in that in that location or in that area where we have the sand kind of overlying the silt or clay and that allowed you know, especially with, um, with a lot of rain that occurred right before this event occurred kind of to help activate that um, then really just this over steepening of the river and the last glaciation kind of carved out in this area it's a very steep slopes and a lot of this and also kind of a question around was there there's at least some logging going on in this area it's kind of debated how much that was exactly important but as we've talked about prior we know that if we remove uh, those uh, trees and particularly their roots uh, over time that then can make the soil a lot more able to be activated and, and create these big mass movements and so just showing you a map here this is just another example from this is uh, showing the oso slide here but just showing that really again this is a landscape that has seen many different landslides actually going out and geologically dating in this area kind of the age of some of these soils we're finding wow this is actually in an area where there's been lots and lots of, of these mass movements that have, are, have occurred over the past several thousand years since the last glaciation and so this is definitely a hazardous area um, but you know this can also then hard to start planning uh, for future uh, future examples as well and it's noted a little bit prior you know just there's many various reasons that we might see for these different types of mass movements um, so again fires kind of removing and logging removing trees but you know many human activities as well so putting in roads and road cuts culverts you know dams going over and compacting soil there's a lot of different factors that can also lead to um, making these um, areas more uh, able or likely to at least uh, end up having mass movements so finally just to uh, the last thing i want to go bring us to very quickly is tied to the lab as well so you're going to be using a google earth file and going to some different locations of mass movements and also using this dogami uh, website so dogami stands for the department of uh, this is the oregon department of uh, geology and mineral industries and Essentially, this, you know, they have this hazard viewer that we're going to be using, and you're going to go and actually put on different layers, particularly this landslide hazard layer here, um, and you're going to um, then go through and kind of look at some places um, and kind of help make some assessments of what's going on in some of these places. But also, then you know you're going to be typing in so in the locator here, okay, where am I need, where do I need to go, where do I need to search? But also the types you can look at these different base maps here and overlay. So you'll come up with something like this. So if I put in Eugene, search here, and I turn on in that previous example, the landslide um, hazards layer, and also then when you go to these base maps, you know, I can turn in and set the imagery that we see here. And so we have a background showing you know, all the landscape, but also you know, these orange and red areas and yellow areas showing us the various landscape um, you know, level of hazard for landslides in these areas. And so you're gonna be making some assessments based on all of that. So that will bring us to the end of this video. Um, and you'll be using, you know, for, uh, mainly focused on our different types of erosion, mass movements, again, applying that in your lab for this module.